get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for <clears throat> the opportunity you've given me to come up here and to share what you've uh, what you've laid on my heart um, and given me a vision of. I thank you. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to not only receive the scientific information, but also related to the great controversy and our own personal um, play and uh, contribution that we have to that positively and negatively or with people around us, being invested in our brother and our neighbor. Thank you so much for uh, your spirit and your life and your grace. Without which, neither, none of us could could walk our Christian walk. And I glorify you that it's given to us by grace, setting us free to love one another with a true freedom. Thank you, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Again, try to keep your questions until the end. A lot of information. Probably the next two presentations will have the most jam-packed information. Um, I go over a lot of lies uh, that I personally was taught and a lot of other lies in other textbooks around in colleges around the world, some high schools too. So imagine yourself sitting in a plane and in front of you in the group of people you see a pastor who's reading a Bible and another gentleman sitting next to him reading a normal magazine. <clears throat> and the one turns to the other and says to the pastor, I'm an atheist, announcing it very loudly and boldly for everybody around him to hear, obviously noticing the book that he was reading, whether he was offended or intrigued, I don't really know. But I was astounded when you heard the pastor respond and say, I'm an atheist too. Huh? <laughs> what? So eager to listen to the conversation, the pastor says, describe to me the God that you don't believe in. The atheist was silent as he contemplated, not knowing if the conversation was actually going to go forward or if this was the end of it. The atheist said, you know, a God who's presiding in the sky, ruling over us with absolute control. Before we're born, he decides who's going to go to heaven and who's going to burn in hell forever. Of course, we have no say in the matter because he's almighty God and he does whatever he jolly well pleases. How dare anybody question him? We're supposed to love him, the atheist said. I don't even like him. He's a monster. I don't understand how anybody could believe in a God like this. Well, the pastor said, I'm an atheist, or he said, I'm an atheist. And the pastor again said in response, I'm an atheist too. I commend you for rejecting a self-serving, controlling tyrant like that, going against the flow of society, if you will. Hypothetically, though, just for conversation's sake, what if a God the complete opposite did exist? Would you want him to? I'm talking about nothing, a God that has nothing but goodness, always, perfectly just. And what if a God existed who was perfect, perfectly merciful to everyone throughout all time? Who would never torture anyone who doesn't agree with him? A God who gives everyone perfect freedom to decide their own destiny. What if a God existed who would rather die than cause an injustice to anybody? Beautiful in the extreme, sheer perfect beauty. What if a God like this would exist? Would you want him to? For more stories like this, check out digma.com. Really great place to get stories. <clears throat> but it's very true and it's very... This story is very near and dear to my heart. This is my wife and my oldest son, my grandson. There's everybody here knows Kevin doing some Boy Scout stuff. Cameron, 
Georgie, you know, when I got sick, uh, or when I got, when we, when we had Georgie, when Georgie was first born, is actually when I got sick. I developed a migraine that was absolutely excruciating, and it drove me into a state of nauseousness where I was sick all the time. I actually lost 20 pounds in just the first month. Getting a part of a sandwich and some soup in me throughout the day was very, very difficult to, to keep down. And I felt very powerless over my Christianity. The foods that I was eating vexed my conscience because they weren't the foods that, that I was accustomed to eating in my Christianity. They were, they were not so good for me. You know, there was nothing like a Burger King burger to settle my stomach. And as ironic as it sounds, it's the truth. It was one of the only things that I could get to go down in some yogurt was another thing. It was the only thing that I could sick, I could eat, but it made me nauseous just thinking about it, knowing the toxins and things that are in the milk that I'm ingesting. I felt very, very powerless over my Christianity during this time period. It was eye-opening. <clears throat> but this is when I met God, because He came down to me where I was, where I'm completely powerless, and gave me strength to overcome. And when I finally met God and saw his face, my image of him turned completely upside down. I had thought that he was a judgmental tyrant, but in fact, he is an immensely loving creator that wants nothing more to have a relationship with us. Now, I knew this intellectually, but sometimes the longest journey is from the head to the heart. And God sometimes allows some bad things to happen to us so that we can have closer intimacy with Him. When I saw Jesus clearly was when He, when I understood the intimacy in which He walked with me. And that was never revealed more to me than in my sickness. And so through this process, I've actually put the presentation together. And in this set, I want to do three things. I want to strengthen your faith in God and in his love. And if you don't know my friend Jesus, I want to introduce you, or at least allow you to rethink your image of him and the, the creator. And if you are God's and you're not doing anything for him, I'm going to try to make you feel uncomfortable. Just so we're on the same page, I am going to be talking about some truths that God's love reveals, and it might be stepping on some people's toes, so I do recommend steel toed show shoes during this presentation. Is there anybody here who thinks a teacher or a textbook should be able to deliberately lie? Of not course me. not. <clears throat> not me. Not for any reason. See, God's law says that we shall not bear false witness. God is our creator and it's actually impossible for God to lie or to askew the truth at all. And his law is, is a description of his character. Everything in the law actually perfectly describes his character. When you go through the Bible and you look at all the places that talk about God's law and all the places that talk about God's character, they are one and the same. God is good and holy and just and perfect and love and righteous. He's truth and pure and spiritual. And the very same thing is talked about about the law of God. There, you, you cannot remove the law from his character. And when God bent down and created mankind in his own image, he actually created us to be honest. This is why lie detector tests are even possible. Because every single person here was created to be honest and truthful. <clears throat> the lie detector tests, when your system gets disrupted because it's doing something against its own character, this same attribute in humanity is also echoed in the laws. For the administrative code here says that instructional material shall present the most factual information. Theories shall be clearly distinguished from facts. Minnesota says a teacher shall not distributely distort or suppress subject matter. Remember the last presentation we talked about all the different definitions of evolution. Cosmic and 
chemical is stellar and organic, down to macro evolution, large changes, and how they're all religious, none of them hold any water in the scientific world. All of these. But there is one, the micro evolution, where things change and adapt from one species to the other. Dogs can create other kinds of dogs. Those was factual, but we're going to look at what the textbooks say during this presentation. The textbook says evolution is a fact, not a theory. Birds arose from non-birds, humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to have any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts. Any more than he or she can deny that the earth is round, rotates on an axis, and revolves around the sun. The textbooks will talk about the Grand Canyon and how the Grand Canyon took millions of years to carve out, and it was carved out by the Colorado River. Now, the fact is, the Grand Canyon exists. The creationists interpret it that it happened fast with lots of water, and the evolutionists interpret it that it happened slow with a little bit of water. The issue is that they're always trying to erase the line, making their interpretation seem like fact. That's the issue. That's the big issue. Here in the textbook it says that the Colorado River is cut through 200 meters of rock. You can look through hundreds of millions of years. This is erroneous. It's not true at all. Let's look at the Grand Canyon itself. You can actually see it's called the Kaibab Uplift. It's green in this picture. Can you see the mountain range there? Well, this is the mountain range with snow on it. Clearly, you can see the elevation change in the mountain range. This is a wrinkle in the continent is what it is. And the Grand Canyon, the top of the Kaibab uplift is between seven and 9,000 feet in elevation. <clears throat> the river goes in about 3,000 feet elevation. It goes 270 miles across this wrinkle in the, in the continent. There's some facts that I would like to point out about the Grand Canyon. The top is higher than the bottom. Did you know that? By over 4,000 feet. The river only runs through the bottom of the canyon. I promise you that that river didn't go up the mountain, carve that canyon, and leave it in its wake. Rivers don't go uphill. So again, like I said, it enters in at 3,000 feet. It comes in at 1,800 feet. Elevation going downhill the entire time. On either side of this wrinkle. <clears throat> 270 miles across. If you filled in the Grand Canyon, it would actually fill up and form into two huge lakes called Grand and Hopi Lake. The remains of the lakes are still there today. You can go and explore them. These huge lakes would have filled up and up and up and spilled over, causing the Grand Canyon to cut out originally very rapidly, and as the water settled, slower and slower, giving the, the wind of the river. Cut through, we have lots and lots of examples of where fast washing water can cut through concrete and steel, causing all kinds of damage instantaneously. As a matter of fact, up at Mount St. Helens, they have what's called the Mini Grand Canyon, where it was laid down by some volcanic activity and a lake washed out and cut a Grand Canyon just a one-seventh of the size. So you'll also notice, as the rivers come together, that they come together in less than 90 degrees. So the rivers on this, what would be the west side, the rivers come together in less than 90 degrees. <clears throat> but we find an anomaly on the other side of the Grand Canyon where the lakes washed in. We find these barbed canyons where they actually go in the opposite direction. These are very rare, and the only way they could possibly happen is if the water flowing out over the top and the bottom flowing back from a breached dam will cause these barbed canyons. So there's evidence that the, the Grand Canyon here was a washout. My question is, there's 25 million square miles of dirt that's missing out of the Grand Canyon, and the Delta only has 1,158 square miles of dirt, the sediment that's been 
progressing over the last 4,000 years. Where's the rest of the Grand Canyon? I mean, 25 million square miles of dirt. 58,000 square miles, or a thousand, I mean, 58,000 square miles for the Mississippi River. These are huge deltas that happen slowly, but when there's a big, fast washout, you don't have the deltas, and we don't have the delta. Although the textbooks will tell you that the Colorado River is cut through millions of years, this is a complete lie. It's not true at all. Science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate. But they're always trying to get that line to be erased for their interpretation, so their interpretation seems factual. Remember in the last presentation, we talked about the Bible being true cover to cover. Archaeologically, we talked about the Dead Sea Crossing and Mount Sinai and all of those archaeological evidences that the Bible is accurate. Here's another really good documentary if you haven't seen it yet. I can't urge you enough to watch this documentary, Patterns of an Evidence in the Exodus. Amazing, amazing documentary. The Bible translation can be trusted, and it's been the same for 2,000 years. When we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we investigate it to our current Bible, we can see that the Bible's translation can be trusted. The mathematics, we went over the probability that the Bible is written by God, and the prophecies in the Bible being fulfilled by Him show that mathematically the Bible can be trusted. I also explained some anomalies in the Scriptures, that the Bible never has a contradiction if you understand that it's thought-inspired. There are places that are dictated, like we went over in the last presentation, but a majority is that it's thought-inspired, and those dictation, those, those uh, if you will, contradictions, like the signs above Jesus' head, go away once you understand that the Bible's thought-inspired. I want to talk a minute for Bible and its misuses, some of the ways that a lot of people use the Bible to prove their point and show how the Bible actually says that we shouldn't be using the Bible in this fashion. Now, I use the Bible in this fashion. The context of the scriptures have to be, have to be implemented. You have to know the context. So the Bible says in Isaiah that priests and prophets, they stagger from beer and they're befuddled with wine. They reel from beer and they stagger when they see visions and they stumble when they're rendering decisions. So then the word of the Lord to them become do this and a rule for this and do that and a rule here and a little there and a little here. So as they go, they will fall backwards and they will be injured and snared and captured. Going from here to there to prove a point is very dangerous. You have to use the context. You have to dig in and know the truth of the scriptures. Second Timothy says it this way, but in the last days, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days where people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, teachers, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, always learning in the scriptures but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Very dangerous to misuse the scriptures in ways that they should not be misused. You have to take the context. Reading the scriptures means you have to mine in. It's no different than doing any other major activity. It takes devotion and time, not something that you can just breeze through. The Bible is true cover to cover. The writers are God's authors, not his transcripts. It is thought inspiration. I can't, I can't um, encourage this, not this thought enough. The Bible and is God's heart being displayed for all. For anyone who seeks to find him, they can look in there and they can see it. Maybe it's time we dust off the Bible and actually get in there and read it a little bit. If you need some help, and that's okay, truthlink.org. I highly recommend the Bible studies. They're a great Bible study. Uh, set put together by a great group of guys. Remember, beautiful in the extreme is what we said about God in the beginning. God predestined the world to be with Him is what we went over in the first presentation. Beautiful in the extreme, God is love. 
If God is love, then why is there evil in the world? Big, great question. I'm going to talk about the first half of that question during this presentation and the last half of that question during my last presentation. Why is there evil? I mean, if God really is good, how can he possibly allow horrible things like this? And it's a good question. But the fact of the matter is, is that love demands choice. You can't have a relationship with anybody without putting some way of choice in the action. I mean, why did God put the tree of fruit of knowledge of evil in the garden? They weren't starving. They had a whole bunch of yeses. It wasn't anything to do with food. It had to do with the choice to be in a relationship with God, to trust His character. That's what commitment is. So when Satan said, God is lying to you, he's selfish and he's power hungry. Eve's trust in the character of God was broken then and there before she ever grabbed that fruit to eat it. Eating the fruit was just the product of the faithlessness that came when her character, when her trust in her character was broken. <clears throat> See, love cannot be commanded. Only love can create love. Satan was the highest ranked angel, full of the total of God's wisdom and beauty, perfect in every way, until iniquity, or the Bible refers to it as, the best that I can define it as selfishness, it literally means bent back towards self. The iniquity was found in your heart. See, his iniquity, or bent towards self, was to overthrow God and to take his place in the universe. Having decided, deceived one-third of the angelic hosts, Satan waged war against Christ, his creator. And the great controversy between God and Satan began. God is selfish, is what Satan said. Love doesn't exist, he said. However, Christ and his angels were victorious, and Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. And the wrath of God was then revealed from heaven. See, the Bible talks a lot about the wrath of God. See, the Bible says that God gave them over to the desires of their hearts. <clears throat> that this is a description of the wrath of God. That God gives them over to their shameful lusts. That God gives them over to a depraved mind so that they will do what is not proper. Love demands choice. And if you don't want to have anything to do with God, God is gentleman enough to allow you to not have anything to do with Him. Yeah. True love demands choice. You're not going to, that's why uh, arranged marriages are always so frowned upon, because true love demands choice. <clears throat> See, God is completely separate from evil. We all need to own up to the responsibility that we have played for the evil that's in this world. We are so quick to cause devastation to our neighbor and yet so quick to point our finger and say it's God's fault. There is no injustice that has happened on this planet that wasn't caused by us. There are tr natural tragedies and that's not what I'm referring to. Being expelled from heaven, Satan decided to deceive Adam and Eve and take over this brand new earth and make it his own dominion. And in this he was successful. And ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan became the prince or the ruler of this world. And thus, the great controversy between Christ and Satan was transferred from heaven to earth. And whether we realize it or not, every single person in this room is caught in the middle of this great controversy. And you need to stay sober because Satan, your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so whoever believes in him shall not die, but live forever, because God is love. Does anybody know what this is? Trap. It's a calf puller. They use it to pull out calves at birth. So there was a city boy that was going by as a calf was being born, and he noticed that they hooked this 
calf puller up to the back of this little calf and they crank, crank, crank and they yanked that little calf out and pretty soon they had a mom out of a little baby cow. And the farmer looked at the city boy and said, do you have any questions? And the city boy said, yeah, I have a question. How fast was that calf going when it ran into the back of that cow? Uh, no, that's not what's happening at all. <clears throat> See, you can look at, there's people that can look at the facts and make the wrong conclusions. Again, I'm, I'm against the conclusions. So here's the history. James Hutton, um, he basically started the, the evolutionary theory um, and said that the earth was much older than everybody had thought. He was around 1795. He said, see, before radiometric dating was available, many people had estimated the age of the earth as only a few thousand years. But a Scottish scientist, James Hutton, estimated that the earth was much older. He used a principle called uniformitarianism. The principle states that the earth's processes occurred today in a similar as those who occurred in the past. See, these are things that he inferred. He hypothesized. He guessed. But it was made popular by a scientist by the name of Charles Lyell, who wrote a book called Principles of Geology, which is what um, Darwin took on the boat with him. He says that he reasoned philosophically against those who regarded the disordered state of the earth's crust as exhibiting signs of the wrath of God for the sins of man. Lyell said that his goal was to free science from Moses, that men of superior talent who thought for themselves, like himself, he would, would not be blinded by the authorities like the Bible. So they gave each layer a name, an age, and an index fossil to tell how old the earth was. <clears throat> Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first, the American Journal of Science. Now this is something that I talked about in the first presentation also. But they say the textbooks will tell you the further down you go, the older the layer is. <clears throat> Here again, there's no dispute over the layers. Evolu evolutionists say that it happened slow over long periods of time. Creationists say it happened fast when the flood was laid down. <clears throat> the fact is that they're there, but they're always trying to get this line to be erased that makes the distinction between their interpretation and the fact. The geologic column is the Bible for evolutionists. And it can only be found in one place in the entire world, and that's in the textbooks. Here, this textbook says, if there was a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. If the geologic co column existed in one place, it would actually be over 100 miles thick. Okay? This is a complete lie, a misrepresentation of the fact. It is true that there are layers, but if there are millions of years old, why is there no soil or erosion marks in between, or soil, for that matter, in between the layers? Experiments and stratification. If you're interested in studying this out for yourself at all, I highly recommend that you go online and you look up experiments of stratification. It conclusively shows that as water rolls across the surface, it lays down multiple layers at once, thereby making the fossil at the bottom could possibly be the young fossil and the one as opposed to the older one at the top, <clears throat> rather than being the other way around. Not to mention that in the flood, when the moon was traveling around the earth, there was no land structures to stop the tides. There would have been a huge tsunami going around the earth, causing this liquef uh, liquefaction to take place putting everything in, a, in a, an, a, an apparent set of order. When you go into a museum, right on the wall, well, you'll have the geologic column and it'll tell you how old they are in the index fossils. And it'll say this layer right here is 70 million years old. Now if you ask the people, how do you know this layer is 70 million years old? They'll tell you, just like the textbooks, that we use index fossils to date the layer. So they'll say that the fossil dates the layer. Okay? So then you go to the fossil and you say, how old is this fossil? And they'll tell you 100 million years old. And if you ask them, how do they know the fossil is 100 million years old? They'll tell you because of the layer that is taken out of it, which is exactly what the textbooks will say. 
So the textbooks say that you can tell how old it is based on the layer, and then the very next page says that you can tell based off of the fossil. This is circular reasoning. There is no science behind this at all. Paleontologists cannot operate this way. There is no way simply to look at the fossils and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks that it comes from. Apart from very modern examples, which are really archaeology, I can think of no case of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. They just don't use them. They're too inaccurate. The um, intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date the fossils and fossils to date the rocks. The geologists have never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling that the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. This is the American Journal of Science. Rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. What? The chain, the charge of circular reasoning in stratigraphy can be handled in several ways, they say. It can be ignored as not the proper concern of the public. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as common practice, or it can be avoided by pragmatic reasoning. This textbook on one page says you date the rocks by the fossil, and the very next page it says you date the fossils by the rocks. This is a complete lie. Sometimes I think we really need to stop and think about what we're saying and doing. See, I want to know how you can tell the difference between 100 million year old and 600 million year old limestone. They'll tell you the index fossil that it comes out of. That's how you tell. It's complete bogus. Let's hear what Bill Nye has to say about it himself. You never, ever find a higher animal mixed in with a lower one. You never find a lower one trying to swim its way to the higher one. Anyone here, really. If you can think <coughs> one example of that, one example of that, anywhere in the world, the scientists of the world challenge you. They would embrace you and be a hero. You would change the world if you could find one example of that anywhere. So, I hope what Bill said is absolutely true, because um, I'm going to demonstrate several, and I hope I do change the world. Here's one where hand print, human hands, were found in the Cretaceous uh, layer, which is with dinosaurs. Here's 200 million year old rock with a shoe print, and you can actually see the twisting of the stitch from the sole. Trilobites, they'll tell you trilobites are great index fossils. They tell you that things formed 500 to 600 million years ago. Well, here's a shoe print of a trilobite being stepped on. That's not supposed to be there because humans and trilobites live together. There's actually two on this same footprint. They've been tested as being very authentic. <clears throat> of course, some people will go so far as to say aliens came down and stepped there. They can't just handle that humans were here with trilobites. Some people say that giant trilobites fell on them, and that's what it is. Those shoe prints aren't, aren't really shoe prints. Those are trilobite prints from giant trilobites. Trilobites come in many, many different varieties and shapes. Here are some isopods from Florida. Look very much like trilobites to me. Here's some living trilobites that was sent to Kat Hovind and his museum from Alaska. Some living... Uh, Grapolites were also said to be a good index fossil for 410 million years old. Grapolites are alive and very well today. It's not an index fossil, they're still alive. <clears throat> they're found in the Pacific Ocean. Ever since William Smith, at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating. Um, I just disagree. There's the low fin fish. Low fin fish are an index fossil. The textbooks will tell you 300 to 400 million years old. This is a complete lie. Low fin fish are still alive today. And I can assure you they don't use their fins for anything other than swimming. 
There is no walking taking place, even though that's what the textbooks will tell you. This person wrote a, wrote a book about it, A Fish Caught in Time. Our great uncle, 40 million times removed. I think that uh, we need to relook at the conclusions from our interpretations. Here's a dolphin head going through several hundred or several million years of layering. Couldn't have happened. At this uh, poses something of a problem when we date the rocks by the fossils. How can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through times in the fossils? Science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate, remember? They'll tell you that dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago. That's what they'll tell you, but when we look at the dinosaur bones, we find blood right in the bones. We find soft tissue in the bones. And this isn't just an anomaly, it's found everywhere. It says, they say that they're going to have to reconsider how the fossils are formed. How about when? Um, that would be another conclusion that you could draw from this. When were the fossils formed? Right off the coast of California, there was actually a dinosaur found. 1925. There's its head, and there's the rest of its body, screwing right across. Shipwrecks is the book you can learn about this in. It's absolutely astonishing. It had a 20-foot neck, had no teeth, and was estimated to be a herbivore. Judge E.L. Wallace, the president of, or not Judge, E.L. Wallace, the president of the National History of Society of British Columbia, said that it was, its neck was fully 20 feet long, it had a short little stubby tail, it ate grass, herbage, and it looked like a plesiosaur. The judge made the same conclusion, that it was definitely from the prehistoric age. Plesiosaur with a very long neck. It's <clears throat> exactly what they found. Here's a 4,000 pound remnant of a dinosaur that was found off the coast of New Zealand in 1977. They took some DNA samples of it and found that it was not a basking whale, as some atheists like to believe that it was a basking whale. There was a marine biologist on board. He examined the animal and said that this was the structure of the animal. So convinced was the nation that they actually made a stamp declaring that they had found a dinosaur. Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years, around 1271 AD, and he reported that the emperor raised dragons to pull their chariots, great big giant lizards. In 1611, the emperor appointed the post for a royal dragon feeder. Why would you have the post for a royal dragon feeder if there was no dragon to be fed? <clears throat> they also raised them for their eggs and blood. They had some medical rituals. We were supposed to have found the bones of the dinosaurs just back just a few hundred years ago. Then how come we find that, that the ancients had inscribed it all over the walls and their furniture and everything if we were the only ones that have seen these dinosaurs? Dinosaurs and man lived together for a short period until we killed them all off and the Ice Age and many other reasons that we'll get into in some other presentations. Standing petrified trees are found in Wyoming National Forest. They say that they're forests, these petrified trees. How can you have petrified trees going through hundreds of millions of years of layering? I mean, how old can a tree really stand there? In Mount St. Helens, when it blew, it knocked over a whole pile of trees. It uprooted them so that the smaller roots were left behind in the soil, but the bigger roots were still attached to the trees. And in Spirit Lake, they actually sank vertical because the bottom part of the tree with the root mass is actually heavier and denser. And so it sunk vertically. And there is in, buried in 15 foot of sediment that is acquired from the bark and things. So you have this apparent forest that's being buried in Spirit Lake due to Mount St. Helens. Which is the same thing we see in the... Uh, in Wyoming, and the broken roots extend through many, many layers. The 27 layers of forest at Yellowstone, same thing. Did not happen over millions of years. This isn't the remnants of forest. This is the remnant of a big flood. Mary Leakey and the Blue Creek happened within weeks or a month of each other. <clears throat> Why would you have stratified trees, petrified trees, going through strata upside down? 
Can you explain that to me from an evolutionary point of view? Upside down. Roots facing up. 18 million year old magnolia leaf in Idaho shale was broken open and it was still green. Oh, I don't think it was 18 million years old. Here's some layers traveling through. Remember, Bill said you never find anything swimming up from one layer to the other. Right? Well, in here we actually find fish that go up through several layers. Not only do we find fish, but we find whale that is literally swimming up from one layer to another through several. The only way this is possible is with a worldwide flood. I mean, there really is a third way you can look at this. The trees were buried in a big upright flood. How fast was that calf going? Science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate. Fossils don't take millions of years. Here's a fossilized dog inside a tree. Very fascinating story. Some fossilized acorns that happened in one year. The boy left them in a bucket of water and the next spring when he went to clean the porch off. Petrified acorns. This bag of flour petrified itself in three weeks. It does not take long periods of time to make fossils. This is all erroneous. These dates are, are fake. They're lies. Lie number five. Do you think it's possible for a person to believe a lie? Satan is the father of all lies. Satan lied was so convincing that one third of the angels serve him. You never find 100% poison. You always find it with 99.99% good stuff mixed in with it. And the little bit of poison is what kills you. You've got to be careful for that little bit. The first lie in the Bible is actually Satan said, you surely will not die. And yet death spread to all men. And remember I said it's impossible for God to lie. But is it possible for a group of people to believe a lie? A whole group of people? How about a nation? Is it possible for a whole nation of people to believe a lie? Yeah. <clears throat> Satan deceives and lies to the whole world, disguising himself as an angel of light, even with great signs and wonders, making the lies so convincing that the whole world believes the religion of selfishness is good and correct. Charles Darwin, when he went on his boat, went to the Galapagos Islands when he was 22, straight out of Bible school. Many Christians taught a false doctrine called fixicity of the species, which meant all the cats originally came off the ark, all different kinds of them. If there's a hundred different kinds in that time, that's how many kinds came off the ark. No fluctuation between species at all. <clears throat> he went on the book with principles of geology. He went to some islands and he discovered in the Galapagos Islands that there was some finches. Some of them had thick beaks because they had harder nuts to break through and some of them had thinner beaks. And he clearly showed that the birds had a common ancestor. And he's absolutely right. They do have a common ancestor. It's a bird. There's no dispute over that. Darwin didn't actually answer the question of his book, though. The origin of species. Not the diversity of species, which is what he talked about. Darwin said it is truly a wonderful fact that all animals, all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. How fast was that calf going? That's the conclusion he reached from thicker or thinner beaks. I just disagree with the conclusion. Remember, all of these are non-science. They're religious. Only the change within a species is, is true. But the textbooks will give you the definition of evolution is change over time. And then just down further in the, in the paragraph, it says it's living things changing over time. And then you flip over to the next page, and it goes over evolution being defined by change in species over time. See, they change and switch and move the definition so that they can make you think and what, how they want you to think. This is completely a lie. Just refer back to the definition that I went over in the first presentation. Most evolution
evolutionists tell you that macroevolution is just microevolution over long periods of time. This is dreaming. The central question in the Chicago conference was whether the, the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomenon of macroevolution. And the answer can be given as a clear no. This is science. Volume 210. Gregor Mendel actually showed that he was the founder of modern science and genetics, and he discovered that parents give the, the children the traits. They don't miraculously pull them out of the thin air. They're given from the parents. It's kind of like when you go into the store to get a cell phone. You don't go into the store and tell them what you want. They tell you what they have. And you have to choose from what's available. The only thing that you have is you can choose. You, the phenotype was to choose of the genetics that you had available to you. Variations do happen, but they have limits. That's the point. Farmers have been breeding bigger pigs for a long time, but you're never going to get one the size of Texas. There's limits. It is true roaches have become resistant to pesticides. That is true, but they're never going to become resistant to a hammer. There are limits, okay? You can get lots of different kinds of corn, but it's all corn. You're never going to get a tomato, a gerbil, or a whale off of a corn stalk. It's not going to happen. It's not science. Remember, science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate. This article here says this is evolution. Flies in the north have 4% larger wings than flies in the south. This is not evolution. This is microevolution. Bigger wings and smaller wings, it's still a fly. Peppered moth, great example. They started off with 95% light color and they ended up with 95% dark. Well, they had dark and light to start with. The whole thing was actually completely fraudulent. Um, evolution, the Evolution Handbook is a great book to check it out. The only time anybody, any, uh, Moss actually landed on the trees when they were glued there. They all landed at the top. The whole thing was phony. But all they did was change the moth. Bigger, smaller wings. They increased the dark and low spots. Did you know that GM and Ford actually puts heaters and air conditioners in the same vehicle? Yeah, because sometimes you're going to want to use a heater and sometimes you're going to want to use the air conditioner, right? God knew that sometimes a dark moth was going to be better than a light moth, and sometimes a light moth was going to be better than a... It shows God's cre creativeness. Icons of Evolution is a great book to talk about this. They radioactive... They put uh, radio waves to some flies to get them to mutate. They got all different kinds of uh, flies. Flies with curled wings, flies with no wings, you know what they're called? Flies with no wings, crawl, or I guess a walk. <laughs> the fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies under any circumstances yet devised, they said. All mutations observed produce flies that were inferior to the original fly. Good observation. Totally agree. Fruit flies must have evolved as far as they can go. Bad conclusion. Okay? Some people make good observations and still come to the wrong conclusions. You can get lots of different horses. You can get zorkies, zonkies, z-dogs, zebras, shebras, all different kinds of horses, and they're all horses. Gregor Mendel's law says that this should be possible. Evolutionists take the, the focus, evolutionists like to focus on the discussion of the scores of examples of microevolution to draw your attention away from the fact that there's no evidence for the first five meanings of the word at all. This textbook says that this fly has a bad mutation, but good mutations are the raw form of, of mutation and natural selection of evolution. Why didn't they actually show a good mutation? Because they don't have one to express. <clears throat> which we'll talk about more in the second half. There has been some small, minute, beneficial mutations, and I will talk about that in the second half. Most mutations are just a scrambling of the information. You might get an extra leg on a cow, 
No new information, the leg is just put in a different place. You might get a short sheet. No new information at all, besides the fact that if somebody was going to chase them down, the mutation would be taken out of the stock. Here's a sheep with two heads. No new information. Here's a mutant turtle, although I'm sure it's not a ninja. Sorry, no double necks for him. You have eyes and no eyes. You're simply deleting the same information. It's not adding information. A lot of people say that this is evolution when a fish loses their eyes. They're switching a part of the gene off so that the phenotype is there. They still very much have eyes in the genome. You put them back in the light and they come back. It just switches the gene back on. You find this all the time. This is not evolution. This is devolution. Although they say homologous structures are evidence for evolution in the textbooks, they say that the similarities between our limbs, our legs, they show and demonstrate that we all came from the same organism. <clears throat> Textbook says that comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. This comparative suggests that there are other varieties of animals all related and they probably evolved from a common ancestor, the textbooks will tell you. This is completely a lie. Different bones develop on different genes in different organisms. Evolutionists can't really explain this and they very rarely even discuss it. <clears throat> it is true, there are similarities. There's another way that you can interpret the information, which God designed them all to have the same function. See, similar design might prove the same designer made them. I went and I discovered this line of mobiles, if you will. I first found this one and I realized that this had to have evolved into the scooter here, and then it had to have evolved into that scooter, and then it had to have sub-evolved into two other species, because all you have to do is look at the similarities and you can make the conclusion that one evolved from the other. It's kind of a funny parable, but the point is that many animals have similar forelimb structures. This is a good observation. But they must have come from a common ancestor? Bad conclusion. To say that they all proved that it came from a rock? Really bad conclusion. Trucks and cars have similarities. They have grills and headlights and windshields and doors and tires. All kinds of similarities, but they don't prove that one sheared from the other or evolved. I mean, how fast was that calf going anyway? Similarities prove that God made a similar function for them. But if you still think that similarities prove commonality, let's look at this parable. So penicillin actually has the least um, chromosomes, and so we must have started as penicillin going up the chromosome uh, evolutionary scale. And then we became horse, uh, housefly and tomatoes. They have identical chromosomes. They're twins, can you tell? And then if we keep going up the evolutionary scale, we'll become either a possum, redwood, or a kidney bean. They all have 22. Can't you see the similarity? I mean, they look identical. <clears throat> keep going up the evolutionary chain and we'll come to humans with 46 chromosomes. And if we keep going through chickens and dogs, which they're twins, you just look at them, we get all the way up to a fern with 480 chromosomes. Similarities don't tell us what about our history. Here's some, we can look at our genes. Actually, if you look at our genes, we're closest to earthworms and rice. That's our relation. How about gestation period? If we looked at gestation period, cats and dogs are 62 days. They're twins, must have evolved at the same time. And elephants are the supreme at 640. See, similarities are good to look for some circumstances, but they don't share your heritage. If amphibians evolved before mammals, why do some amphibians have five times more DNA than mammals? And some amoeba have a thousand times more DNA. Hmm. The really significant finding that comes in light from comparing the proteins, the amino acid sequences, is that it is impossible to arrange them in any sort of evolutionary series. There is little doubt that if this molecular evidence had been available, in a century ago, the idea of organic evolution might never have been accepted. You've heard that monkeys and their similarity to us proves 
parenthood, that it, it's our family, and that she, uh, orangutans are less similar, so that proves that they're less related to us. Well, they say that they're 1.6% difference. That means, now the genetic difference between humans and the nearest relatives, the chimpanzees, is at least 1.6. It doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, it's a gap of at least 48 million nucleotides, and a change of only three nucleotides are fatal in animals. It is not possible. Although even now they're coming up with a 7.7% difference in genetics. They always talk about the similarities, but they never talk about the differences. Like our hands, and our feet, and our hair, and our brain, and our hips. The feet is, is absolutely one of my pet peeves. They put the orangutan is always next to us, or the gorilla, because the gorilla has the closest feet. But the orangutan is supposed to be genetically the most similar to us. They do the switch and date thing. The similar structures nearly always have similar plans. DNA is the, in this case. Similar bridges have similar blueprints. And, and this hardly constitutes evidence that one shore from the other or they were erected by tornadoes. See, the textbooks will tell you that the similarities in amino acids, the 20 different amino acids, prove common heritage. This is completely a lie. This is really simple. Amino acids are like the alphabet for the DNA. With, with a 26-letter alphabet of English, you can make lots of different words and lots of different sentences and paragraphs to, make you, to help explain things. It's the same thing with life. If we were only able to eat our own amino acids, process our own amino acids, then the bee wouldn't be able to get pollen from honey or from a flower to make honey for the bee and also for the bear and also for us. If we didn't share amino acids with anything, we would be able to only eat ourselves. This is not a good world to live in. Common amino acids does not prove heritage at all. Natural selection, the textbooks will tell you, demonstrate and prove evolution. Natural selection. <clears throat> Creationists have no argument with natural selection that we thought of at first. It is only um, a conservative process that remains, that removes defective organisms and keeps the species strong. Natural selection may have a stabilizing effect, but it does not promote speciation. It is not a creative force, as many people have suggested. Natural selection can act only on the biologic properties that are already exist. It cannot create uh, properties in order to meet an adaptational need. Finches with larger beaks, evolutionists by natural selection has occurred in just one year. This is not true. How long would it take if you were in a factory and you were quality control and they were spitting cars out and you were in quality control to make sure that car was built correctly and all the systems worked right, how long would it take to turn into an airplane? It's not going to happen. It's not going to change into a plane. It's quality control. Over a long period of time, natural selection can lead to evolution. This is a lie. Science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate. Evolution is a great postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses must henceforth bow in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts which all lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. No, that's a religion. The Bible says that we should keep what is committed to you and trust avoiding the oppositions of falsely so-called science. If there is a God, you should find out who he is and what he desires. The one and only living God is love. Imagine if God had killed Satan the very first time that iniquity entered his heart. The first time he decided he was going to do a wrong to somebody else and God squashed him out. Everybody would start serving him out of necessity and fear. See, because God is separate from evil. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan became the prince and ruler of this world. 
For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The beginning of Satan's downfall, <clears throat> Satan's true character first began to be exposed when Christ, the arch enemy, came to this world to be the savior of mankind. And he demonstrated his character. What was the first thing he did? He tried to kill the children. What kind of a low-down scoundrel goes after our kids? Then he tried to kill Christ by having him throw himself off the top of a temple. And he tried to kill him by having him stoned. Satan tried to kill Christ over and over and over. But the Father's protection was always there. So the only way that God could expose Satan's true character was to remove his protection from his son, Jesus Christ, whom he did at Gethsemane. And he made it possible for Satan's hidden desire from the beginning of the rebellion to be exposed at the cross once and for all. And once Christ was in the hands of Satan, he chose for him the most shameful and painful death man had ever invented, the cross. See, by dying, Jesus' selfless love for us was revealed. The power of love. God's power. And at the same time, you can see Satan's love for power. Christ was willing to endure it all, not only to expose the selfish way of life, but also to save humanity from the curse of the law. The Savior of all mankind, the Bible says, especially of believers, it is impossible for God to lie. At the cross, Satan was exposed to be the murderer of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. May we never be on his side, on Satan's side.